will work on um, setting up the data manager on the Bitcoin site. What changes need to be applied on the Bitcoin system if you're adding a bit time to it on the system. So now that we've got our system connected, we can just go to quick start. Okay, let's just check here. Yeah. Okay, so just auto detect. Yeah, we've got a few extra devices plugged in. So it's not going to auto detect it. So um, here we can now see that we've got the system set up currently as single phase parallel. So what we're going to do is just unconfigure it. So we're going to drag our inverter out of our configuration block, put them in the unconfigured devices, and there from on, we can change our setup back to three phase. Just click OK there. <coughs> I've got our three blocks over here again. And then we can identify each inverter separately by just right clicking on it, flashing its LEDs. So we can see that is our inverter on L3, for instance. So we'll drag that one into L3. We'll right click on the next one, flash that one's LEDs. And we'll see that's the middle <coughs> inverter. So we want to put that one on L2. Same goes for the last one, we'll just double check it anyway. It's definitely the first one, that one is connected on L1, in this case. And now we can see that it says the system setup has not been synced yet. So we first have to go to our configure tab again, and then say in send configuration. So do note when sending any configuration changes from the VBus system configurator, it removes all the assistance from all the devices. So we click yes, take note of that. And then our system is started up in three phase again. So now we're going to start on our first inverter. So L1, the first inverter in the block, is always going to be the master of the system. So we will go on the master first, and we right click on that, open the new configure. And that will automatically open up the software. assistance on the device. Just click OK. It opens up the VE configure for that inverter. So as we can see, all of our settings are still present on the inverter that we've set. So we didn't do any firmware updates. The firmware updates reset the inverters to defaults. So we've only changed the configuration so we double check that all our settings are correct. We've got our grid code standard, that's correct. Our inverter settings are all correct for corresponding battery still. And all our values we can confirm is correct. So now we can go to our assistance tab. You'll see we have no assistance. We're going to start again over here with our ESS assistant and then load the ESS assistant onto the unit. So here we'll follow the manual again. We're just going to follow the settings that we had previously. Our battery capacity has been set correctly. Uh, we do not want to change the battery type. We already input to the ones recommended values. Sustained voltage is also recommended at 50 volts. Uh, these values, I'm not too sure what freedom wants, so we can go and check on Google. Open a new tab, and we'll just Google Victron 
and feed them one. Um, the first result is going to be a, a Victron compatibility page, or maybe a second result, but it's generally on the first page of Google. For my introduction, I'm just interested to reference our settings values. I'm going to check the ESS assistant. <coughs> Yeah, I can see our dynamic cutoff values. I can input those values. values according to our battery manual. Uh, this is a bit higher for Freedom 1 than the recommended or the standard. So the Freedom 1 recommends a 2 volt leeway for the battery voltage to rise for the better connect again. <coughs> and in here now we have to select are there any PV inverters connected to the AC output on the multi quantum system. So if we had a single phase PV inverter connected onto L3 of the system, we would have to just indicate over here as well, yes. So the master has to be told that there is a PV inverter on the system, even if there is no PV inverter on the master. But in this case, we're going to simulate a three-phase PV inverter on the system. So each inverter is going to have PV on the output. So we'll just say yes on the master inverter. It's going to ask us about the frequencies. So into the frequencies, <coughs> which are used by the PV inverter, for reducing power and disconnecting. So these are values that are going to apply when the inverter is disconnected from the grid, and it's controlling the Fermi's the frequency shift. So the nice thing about the integration of Fermi's and Victron is the default values are already set to work perfectly with Fronius inverters. So if we've got a Fronius that we're installing, we just leave these as default. But if you're doing an ABB or any other inverter, those values might just change slightly. Um, but it's not too drastic change. So here it's going to ask us what's the total solar power. So here's the total PV inverter power that we have to input. That's the total of the whole system. So if we've got a 5 kVA on L3, we're going to have to put in 5 kVA over there. But we've got, for in this instance, let's say an Eco 27, that's 27 kilowatts. And our total installed solar panel power is, let's say, 30 kilowatts. We over panel it a bit. So this value just is just going to be ignored in any way, so it's going to be the maximum of the inverter. This only applies if it's less than the inverter power. So it uses the amount of PV that's on the system, the inverter size, or the amount of PV power if it's less than the inverter, and then according to the PV power that's available, it will adjust the frequency limits to achieve the exact amount of power it requires. So over here we can say it's, see, it's too much solar power for our 3 kVA system. So we have to go back, say OK, or we'll just, for this, in this case, say <coughs> we've got three 10 kVAs connected, so we're going to ignore that in any way. So now we've got our system set up written on the master. We have to go say send settings, and we only have to say send to this device, because we have to send the assistant. Only to this device. Only to the master. So again? Only to the master inverter. Um, no, all the inverters. You can't send so I'm going to have to. To all devices. Uh, yeah, so if I go. Oh, yeah, to do one more. Send settings and say all devices. 
It's just going to say the assistant setup will not be set. Oh, okay. So it has to be sent to only this device. So if you're not, if you're not setting up any assistance, you can go all devices. Yeah, so you, all these settings you can adapt. Okay. And it goes to all devices, and then just add your system yeah. to this device. I'll just quickly configure my PV power here. It won't allow you to have more PV power on the system. Let's just go in this case with a, say an 8 kilowatt inverter <coughs> with 9 kilowatts being to be safe. Okay, it's going to give us an overview of the V-config settings. We're happy with that. Now we can go say send settings to this device only. And we'll say the device is going to be switched off while the system is set. So you're going to select send to all devices. It's just not going to upload the system. Any questions? So it's going to say that it was successfully written. Now we can close the V configure. We're done with setting up our master inverter. And we can go on to our first slave inverter. So if you've got inverters on this phase added on, you're going to have to configure those inverters as well and add the ESS assistant to each and every inverter. So we're doing that now for the second phase. Also going to warn us again that there is no system currently on the device. Okay, there. You can see all our settings are carried over correctly. We just have to go to our assistance, add an assistant, add our ESS assistant, and just start. When we read the welcome remarks, we just have to set our battery system, our capacity battery type. We don't want to change it. We already set it to freedom one. Our sustained voltage is correct. And now it's asking us if there's PV inverters on this inverter. So on the output of this one, yes, so we've got a three-phase inverter. So I'm going to say yes. And that's all it's asking. It just wants to know does that phase have a PV inverter. Click next and I can say send settings modified settings to this device. <coughs> and switch off. So if you've got, for instance, six inverters in the system, two for, for each phase, only the master of each phase is going to ask you if you've got a PV inverter installed, and then the slave is going to have the normal slave assistant on it. So just make sure that each master of each phase is set correctly, that it's got either a PV inverter installed or not. Now that one has been configured, we close it out. And we can go on to our inverter on phase 3. Just double check all the settings anyway, always. 
and then we add an EAC assistant. Start the assistant, we do all the basic setup. And it's going to ask us if we've got a PV inverter on the last phase. So yes. And then that's it. Now we can go say send settings. This device again. And it will upload the assistant to the last device. The system has been reconfigured. We told it that we added a PV inverter to it. So we can close out this software and unplug our MP3. So next what we're going to do, we're going to make sure our Servo GX device is plugged in. Let's quickly turn that around the viewer. So our V bus is plugged in onto our GX. Yeah. So that's all it needs. And I'm just quickly going to connect it onto the Wi-Fi and then I'll put it on the big screen. settings quick under the remote console make sure the disable password check has been ticked and then it's enabled on LAN and enabled on VRM so that's good Through the setup on the GX device for the ESS assistant. Um, so you're going to be greeted with the device list first time the GX starts up. Uh, so we can go into our settings. Under the general, we've got our access level that can be changed to user or super user, which is not necessary. Um, remote support that creates a direct link for Victron to access the system. If you ever have problems um, where you can't access the system by remote console, Victron will still have a connectivity to the GX device if that is activated. But we can also reboot it and disable our audible alarm and the uh, basic settings. Over here we can perform a firmware update. You can see our current version and um, under online updates it's recommended to just keep it on check only and put it on auto update. Certain features uh, are, are required to be on the latest firmware on the inverter um, and as well as latest firmware on the MDPT. So all the products have to be on the uh, uh, corresponding firmware version to work reliably. So you can perform an update, a date and time. It's important to make sure that you set the time zone in South Africa, otherwise all your data is going to be up by two hours. Um, like I said on the remote console, initially you have to disable the password check. If you don't want any password to access this remote console via VRM or your local network, or you can enable a password and then it will just require a password every time you log in. So you can say enable a password and then if I refresh the remote console, it's going to ask me for that password. 
and then make sure it's enabled on DRM. Disable that. That gives you the capability to access it remotely via the internet. And then enable on LAN, that's just on the local network. You want to be able to access this screen. Um, the system setup, you can create a change the system name. There's a bunch of predefined names, or you can set it as a user defined and put in a custom name. Yeah, if you've got a Quattro inverter, you can set both of your AC inputs as well. Or if you've only got a multi plus, you're going to have to set your AC input one to represent the correct power source connected onto that. So, generator, shore power, the grid. Um, battery monitor, so that's if you've got a lithium battery connected, it's recommended to put that on automatic and it will automatically prefer the lithium battery. You just don't have our comms cables on there yet. Like that here. GVCC will be forced on automatically. Let's just plug in our battery communication. Because it's a compatible battery, you can see that we don't have really, really have to worry about those settings. Make sure you plug it into our BME scan, put our terminator, and you'll see as soon as we plug in, in all the settings will be adjusted automatically. DVCC is forced on because that's a must have for lithium ion batteries that communicate. Uh, that's the distributed voltage and current control. So, from the battery, it gives a certain voltage and current limit depending on the state of charge. So, so if the battery reaches closer to 100%, the charge current limit drops close to zero. So, if you don't have DVCC switched on, the Victron system is going to ignore that charge current of zero and still carry on charging the battery at a minimum, but it's not going to drop to what the battery is enforcing in the system. So make sure the battery is switched on and then according to the manual, the rest are toggled as you wish. Um, limit charge current, so that's if you want to hard limit the maximum charging current the battery. But it's only recommended if you've got a limited battery in the system. And the DVCC isn't working reliably. That's only present on non compatible batteries that claim as compatible. Okay. Uh, display language, the adaptive brightness for the touch display, if you've got that. Um, and in your language, you can try and figure it out in a different language. Let's do that. And VRM online portal. This is where we can enable online logging to the VRM online portal. Um, and our VRM portal ID, which is what we use to link the system to our VRM site. You can set our login interval on default on 15 minutes, you can change that interval to once a day or only one minute. So if you set it to once a day, it's going to accumulate the data on the device and it just upload it once a day. Uh, use secure connection, it's just uh, enforced standards, depending on your internet. Um, Last contact, in the last communicator put in the VRM portal. Uh, any connection errors, if you've got internet connectivity problems. Um, VRM two-way communication, so that has to be switched on if you want to be able to access your MPPT uh, or settings on your MPPT remotely or do remote firmware updates or do remote settings uh, on the VE configure on the inverters or just change the ESS settings from your dashboard. So your M2 way communication always has to be switched on, I would say. And the reboot device with no contact, so if it loses connection to the internet, you can set it to reboot after a given time to try and see if it's maybe uh, connectivity between the server and the router or just internet. 
And then if you line up internet, it's going to show you how much data is on the internet. Over here we've got the ESS. So we've got our mode. So we touched a bit on this yesterday. So we've got our optimized with battery life. So that always tries to keep it tries to keep your battery charged to 100 percent depending on the amount of PV excess power you've got available. So we can see we've got a minimum SOC limit which we can set. So I can set this lower now, but my active SOC limit has determined that I only have 30 percent of excess solar power available to recharge my battery. So I'm not going to be able to go lower than that unless the PV recovers, the sunshine uh, sunshiny days come back and we have 100% excess capacity available, then the system will allow the battery to discharge to 100%. But that's determined automatically by the algorithm. But it always tries to keep the battery fully charged. And optimized without battery life, that just ignores the active SFC limit and it will always discharge your battery to 30% unless there's a grid failure then it will go lower. So whatever excess PV you've got available, that's 10% or 5% or 0% for the day, that is going to be topped up to your battery. But every night you're going to discharge your battery to 30%. So it's not recommended if you don't have enough PV power or limited PV power to install. Uh, peak shaving, so if you want to reduce power from your ESCOM or from your grid source um, and you are sitting at your active limit, for instance, um, and you are drawing power from ESCOM all the time just to feed your loads, the battery has been discharged, then that will just allow the battery to assist with the peak loads from your, your utility that you draw. Over here we can limit the inverter power while it's on grid. How much power must it convert from the DC bus? Our grid set point, that's the value we're going to be drawing from the grid at all times. So that is going to affect uh, how the multi-phase multi regulation works. So over here, go okay, there, we can see we've got a total of all phases. Like I explained yesterday, that's going to allow feedback on one phase and draw power on another phase to try and compensate for unbalanced loads on your three phase system. But on the, if you've got an electronic meter, it's going to count the reverse feed on the one phase as positive power you're buying, and in the other power you're drawing on the phase, it's compensating for. It's also going to calculate that as power. So generally in South Africa it's always kept on per individual phase in the safe. So that multi-phase regulation is always going to try to keep the consumption from the grid at 110 watts or this set value. As long as our battery is above our minimum SOC. Over here we can set our grid feeding. So if we want to feed in our excess AC PV power and DC PV power, we can activate or deactivate it here, as well as set a maximum limit for how much we want to reverse feed to the grid. Our scheduled charge levels, if you want a battery to be at a certain state of charge at any given time of the day, over years we can achieve that. So if you want the battery to be at 60 percent, 12 o'clock of the day, or 12 o'clock at night, every day, you can set it to be like that. Yeah. So every day, it's going to start at 12. Uh, you have to set the duration. So you can say, for instance, 12 hours or 6 hours or 5 minutes or whatever. It's going to keep the, bat the PV or the battery SOC limit 
at 60%. And then if it's above that limit, what was it used to feed your loads with excess power, uh, battery, and PV, or just PV? So it's going to keep your battery at 60%. So it's going to let every day also use more? Oh, yes. So here yeah, you can say uh, weekdays or weekends, and then from Monday until Sunday. With that as well? If you use the without battery light work and uh, you don't have enough PV, could you then use that to make sure that your battery has at least charged once a week? Yes. Okay. So you, you can, can say yes. Yeah. yeah, so you can say once a week. Okay. okay. So weekdays. Uh, that's just going to be uh, every day. So it's going to be based out just to pick the day. Yeah, but I'm saying once you, you know you don't have enough PV, your PV rate was that big, so you're using without battery life so that you can discharge once you night. Yes. And you can make sure that your battery is at least charged once a week. Perfect, yeah, to do that. Thing. You can also have like a um, what do they call it? Time of use okay. setup. Like yeah. this. So you can set your battery to be different time of the day. Yes. It must be at this limit. Okay. Whether it charges with ESCO or just idles. Not discharging the bed. So that's ESS, and then the next section is energy meters. The energy meters installed, they would be set up over here. So here we've got a signal phase one, for instance. So we can see we can have it as a role as either measuring generator, and when it's active, we've got one AC input, and it's Seeing power from this meter that's set up as a generator, it will automatically note that the system is running on generator. As well, if, if, we've, as if we've got a SMA or other non-supported or communicating inverter, and we just want to measure its power, we can set it to measure as a PV inverter. Or just the AC meter, which measures a dedicated load on your system. Yeah, so, yeah, then um, if you've got a three phase meter, you can also set it up um, as a grid meter and PV inverter. So, if you install it in a single phase system, you can use your three phase meter to measure your grid consumption and in two PV inverters that you've got connected onto your system. So, then over here you'll just say it's phase type change to single phase instead of multi-phase on your multi-phase meter. Manage a box and GX to the same Wi-Fi network or LAN network. We can just go and say press to scan, to start the scan, <coughs> and then give that a chance to run through there. Check our settings over here with our mod bus. Go back to our inverter. Uh, we'll just make sure that it's set correctly so we make sure it's on TCP uh, to communicate with the Victron systems. So it must be the mod bus that is set on TCP and in the SunSpec model type is int plus SF. Make sure the inverter control by our mod bus is switched on. Send those settings. Let's make sure our inverter is set up correctly. Wait for the scan to finish. So while that carries on, we'll just run through the rest of the settings quick. Here we've got our wireless AC sensors. So these are some of the older uh, AC 
current sensors that we had available. Um, I don't think there's a, many of them available in stock anymore, so we're not going to touch on that. And Modbus TCP devices, if you've got any Modbus TCP devices you want to integrate uh, as third party products, can I be there? We're not going to cover that. Ethernet. Ethernet. So if you have your server connected via the LAN network, over here you can change the settings of that LAN network and also see if it is connected. Over here we can have a look at our Wi-Fi, the create access point, so that's the access point built in on your GX device. So if you want to connect to it locally by the access point, can activate this or deactivate it if you don't want to connect by the access point. And then under our Wi-Fi networks over here we can connect to our internet connected Wi-Fi network. So GSM modem, if you had a GSM GPS modem, uh, over here where you would set it up. Um, under the Bluetooth, you can enable the onboard Bluetooth or disable it. And then you can also change the default pin code. And then over here is where you would set up the GPS settings, just the format and then your speed units. That's for automotive installations. Generate the start stop. So if we have our relay one, go a bit down, we can see we've got our relays. So over here we can set the function of our relays. That can be either alarm, if there's any alarm present on the system, it will close the relay. Or generate the start stop functionality. Or we want to switch on the tank pump or just control it manually or have it controlled by temperature rules. So for this instance, we're going to use it as a generator start-stop functionality. And now if we go back to the generator start-stop, we've got all the options over here. It's going to show the current state of our generator, and any errors, the total runtime for the day, the entire total runtime for the generator on the system, Time to service, 38 hours. And further in the setting menu, we can set up the service interval. And auto start functionality. So if the system reaches any condition where it must start the generator, it must automatically start the generator. Um, manual start, if we just want to test the generator or run it for a given time, we can figure it out here. Um, under the daily runtime, we can have a look at historic conditions or runtime values of the generator on which day did it run for how long. Then next, next we've got the settings, last. Over here we can set our minimum runtime. So it's the minimum time that the relay is closed. So it's, it can be set from zero or up to not sure what's the maximum, but I think it's maybe an hour and a half, three hours. So you can set the minimum runtime that the generator has to be activated. And warm up time, so that just allows for the generator to start and then warm up before the system connects onto the generator. Same as for the cool down time, so the system disconnects from the generator and allows a given time for the generator for it opens the signal again to switch it on. So if we have a Quattro inverter, we can select and detect the generator at the AC input. So whichever AC input the generator is configured to run on, if it has sent out the signal to start the generator, but it's not seeing any voltage on that input, it's going to alarm when there's a signal active but no generator input available. 
and then also <coughs> alarm when there's a signal active, but you don't have the generator reporter stopped. At quiet hours, if you want to run on different conditions at different times of the day, and then our runtime and service. So here we can manually input our existing generator's total runtime on the day we connected it. And then we can set our service intervals. And then the Victron system will calculate the runtime on top of the existing runtime of the generator. And then your service timer, if you've serviced it, you can reset the service timer. So now it will go back to 50 hours, not 38. And then on top, we've got our conditions. So in here, on loss of communication, so if we lose communication with the system, or the servo loses communication with the system, what is it going to do with the signal? Is it going to keep the generator running? Or is it going to stop the generator if it is running? Or maybe if it's not running, it must start the generator in the off-grid side. And then stop generator when AC input is available. So if we have a quattro inverter and we've got mains on AC input one, we can tell it that it must stop the generator as soon as ESCOM has recovered on AC input one. And it will immediately switch off the generator. Um, here we've got some conditions to activate it. So we can enable the battery state of charge, start the triggering. So we can say here when the battery is lower than a certain value, and then we can say um, after a condition is reached, we can say how many seconds must it wait. So if the battery is at 19% or 10 seconds, it must switch on. And then it must stop again when the battery is above 29% for how many ever seconds. And then if you have quiet hours activated, you can start the generator at lower values during those quiet hours, or at higher values. You can start it on battery current, so if the battery current goes above a certain level, and then back below a certain level. Same goes for battery voltage, or AC load. Over here is if there is any alarm active, if it's a high temperature or overload alarm, so if we have a high temperature alarm active for, let's say, five seconds, it must start the generator because it's an off-grid site or uh, how can I say, a mission critical site where the power has to be on all the time. You can't have a power failure even due to overload or over temperature. Um, and in periodic runtime, you want to run a generator once a month just to make sure that it still cranks and the battery is still charged. And tank pump, so if we have our relay set as a tank pump, we can just configure it to monitor. Let's go back in, sorry. We can just configure it to monitor one of our tank inputs if we have one connected. And then if that value is on the tank sensor is below a certain percentage, it will switch the tank pump on. But we don't have any tank sensors connected. Um, services. So here, what was TCP setting? You can enable or disable that. Um, if you've got the normal GX device, you can access the BMS scan port over here and then see what its current board rate is set at. Or you can just disable the BMS scan if you're not going to be using it and have a look at the network status. Same goes for the VE CAN port. So over here, we've got some more options. So by default, it's going to be on VE CAN and links BMS, that's 250 kilobits. But if you only have a servo GXS, which only has one CAN bus or VE CAN connection, we can still set it as a CAN bus BMS. 
and connect our canvas PMS onto the device. But then we can't use our VE can to monitor any Victron products. Because Victron products only communicate on 250 kilobits. And then last over here we've got our IO, it's our analog inputs. So here we've got our resistive tank sensors and our resistive temperature sensors which we can activate or deactivate if it is connected or not. And then digital inputs or outputs, it senses a 5 volt signal on digital input 1 and you can activate any one of these alarms on the system indicating the generator is running disable the touch input control or that there is an alarm active. Right. Let's go back to the PV inverters. See if we've got any inverters yet. Press the scan again. So we've got our Modbus PCP switched on over here. And then we'll give it a minute to scan. It's not going to pick it up, you can also add it manually, but we'll first see if it picks it up. Just give it a second. Any questions so far? Yeah, I was just going to ask So, so do you have to feed power to the common point to get those relays if you're wanting to now activate uh, a pump or uh, so you mentioned like 5 volts or 12 volts, do, do some of the relays have a voltage limit? Do you have to supply power to the relay that's the inverter, supply power to a coil for example? Yeah, no, no, so you're going to have to supply power that's going to be extended 60 volts or to 300 volts AC, 60 volts DC, 1 amp. Okay, so they don't get power from the motor, whatever relay you want to use, you have to feed power to it. You're going to have to feed power, yes. Yeah, so you've got all three points for the work. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure, I think it's maybe one amp or maybe five amps. But then this will be stated on the back end. Okay, we're just going to add it the IP address manually for this demo. Let's check here 192.168.250.181. So that can also be viewed under the network settings, under the general area is on network. We first have to go to the server with wizard. Yeah. Just the network, but uh, just show the yeah. But we first have to complete the solar web visit. You can go further settings. Okay. Yeah, let's show the network in now. Okay, yeah. So I'm just going to add that IP address there. Got there. Let's say we know what it was. It's one nine two. Eight, I'm just going to adapt that according to our Fermius. <coughs> Let's see if we can pick it up this way. So now, scan it again. But that could be because I'm just connected onto the hotspot of the frame is now. I 
whether that will allow it to communicate. site over here just to um, show case how the Proteus would integrate so, um, because we don't have a, a running unit we can't demonstrate that currently we're just going to go back to our PV inverter setting and then we're going to say that we have completed our scan we go under our inverter so it will pick up a PV inverter, which was scanned. And then over here, we can see the position, which we can change. Either it's on the AC input one, AC input two. But for that, you do require the energy meter to be able to monitor its power. But if it's on the AC output, it will just monitor its power by the victims. And then phase, we can't change the phase type of the inverter obviously so it's a three phase inverter and then over here we can select to show it on our main overview or not show it on the main overview so if we go back over here and we're not going to be showing it then the inverter won't be showing up over here it will just be in the devices so if we had a inverter connect configured to be on the input side so if we had multiple inverters on the system we would just configure the other <coughs> inverter which it would pick up as to where it is located in the system and so forth there any questions so far hey there you go. Yeah, so that's the basic setup you're going to require for your Framius inverter to incorporate with the Victron system on the output. So, uh, when I set up like that, what's the maximum uh, critical loads I can possibly permit? So let's say for in this instance they've got a 30 kVA Victron backup system. So you still don't want to exceed the output of your inverter system. So maximum would still be um, 30 kVA less the power factor. So it's going to be, for instance, 24 kilowatt. Um, 24 kilowatt. So not, obviously you don't want to ideally exceed that. So what I'm saying is, can you add a PV inverter? And the capability of a TV inverter and the capability of your. Uh, no, not reliably. Eh? As, 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 as soon as there's the PV inverter trips or anything causes it to throttle, then you're going to overlay your system immediately. It's going to be a big overlay. So, preferably, you don't, want any, you don't want any loads exceeding the capacity of the inverter on the output of the inverter. Ever. So, then you don't stand the chance of damaging the inverters or overloading them. So you, 
this is only going to assist in the case where currently the inverter isn't going to be producing heat, only the Fronius is going to be producing power to feed the AC loads, and then the DC power is reverse fed to feed the non critical loads over here. So, so theoretically, what would you safely supply the um, safely, I would say 20 kilowatts on the TKD system. It will be in line. So you're going to save if your Fronius can produce 20 kilowatts, you're not going to be inverting any power from your DC bus. So then you're going to be feeding 20 kilowatts with an efficiency loss of 1% instead of 5 or 2% on your MPPT and then another. 3 or 4 or 10 percent depending on the temperature of your inverter just to feed your loads. You're going to be producing 25 kilowatts to feed 20 kilowatts of load. So, uh, so on, on, the, on the big part, right, you could, um, for 50 seconds, I think you can run about uh, 1.3 percent of it, or 1.3 times the install zone to a 5 kVA, you could run about 6.4, I think, for about 50 minutes or something. No, it will overload if you exceed 5 kV. It's going to overload. So it can, it can double, well, overload and double its capacity, but it's only going to be for uh, 20 milliseconds. It's going to be a very short period. So then for a PV inverter on your other, <coughs> your, your Victron, wouldn't it be okay then to say, all right, we can one to one the system? So the PV inverter should be around about the same. Yes, we, we can. Yeah, we still have to work out with the one to one yeah. for PV on our outputs. I, so I can't really see that. The ratio between yeah. the PV inverter and the inverter supply. Yeah. I think the safest would be a one to one or one to two. Yes, one to one. Yeah, but yeah. So then, uh, that's also for the reason so that you don't exceed the capacity of your bidirectional inverter if you're reverse feeding to charge your batteries. Yes. So the the. Inverters is going to have a maximum capacity of 5 kVA or negative 5 kVA to charge the batteries in the air. So if you're going to exceed that on the output, again, the reverse feeding, it's also going to blow up the inverter. It's going to damage the output circuit. So you can't, you can't say, I've got a 5 kVA inverter, a 5 kVA grid line, I can now run 10 kVA. No, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not talking about the reverse feeding. I'm saying you've got a PV inverter. You've got a load of about, let's say you've got a load of about 15, 15 uh, kilowatt on the critical side, right? So if the PV falls away, you will theoretically you will draw from whatever you cannot get from the uh, from the uh, inverters, you will then draw from the SCOM side. Yeah. Right? So in a scenario like that, I'm not saying when the grid falls away, I'm saying in a scenario like that when you have stable grid feed, uh, what you know, what is the maximum load you could possibly on the critical load that would be the under? So I think, uh, whatever the I think theoretically depending on your breaker, because remember something like that has hundred amp transfer switch. So you could then theoretically yeah. have a hundred amp on that phase yeah. if the grid is there. Yeah. So regardless if PV is there or not. Yeah. If PV comes in, it'll like lower that and as soon as PV falls out it'll kill more from the grid. Yeah. So that's dependent on your AC current limit set yeah. or your circuit breaker. So you yes. could run, you could overrun that, but then if the grid falls away suddenly, yeah. you could have issues. Yeah. Yeah, so still the output capacity of the inverter is surface. These guys have blown a fuse, I mean, like a DC back of fuse, because of the There's some specific something to yeah. which is... Shit. <laughs> yeah, so the, the PV the PV inverter on the output is only going to assist with efficiency. Yeah. And I'm optimizing it. The solar maximum capability. So the best is if you want any ex extra loads, bigger loads on the system, is install a grid meter and then you can feed it with excess PV which is on the output connected on the output side of the inverter system. So if you've got an energy meter, you can also install another Fronius on the input just to feed those input uh, or non-essential loads 
and also achieve zero feeding with just one nickel compatible energy. 